People sometimes ask why we focus on the breath. And they often have their opinions as why we shouldn't be focusing on the breath. One is that you want a place for the mind to stay as it goes through aging, illness, and death. And of course, when you die, the breath won't be there to focus on after death. So they say, why don't you focus directly on the mind? A part of the reason is because it's hard to focus directly on the mind. And many times the breath is what's getting in the way of seeing subtle things in the mind clearly. And so you have to work through the breath in order to get to that point where you can look at the mind directly. And if you could focus on a state of awareness where you're blocking out the breath, well, that's, that's the problem. You're blocking out an important part of your awareness. The sermon doesn't come from a blocked out state of mind. It comes from an all-around state of mind, what the Buddha calls Mahagatang Chitang, the enlarged mind. The image he gives of concentration is of a mind that, of an awareness that fills the whole body. The second question is, well, if you're focusing on the breath, why do you mess around with the breath? Why don't you just let it alone? Well, it's very hard to let the breath alone because the breath is uh, an intentional process in the body. It's what the Buddha calls bodily fabrication. And we have a lot of issues with the breath. Many times we don't realize it, but they're there. You're going to start digging them up as you meditate. You find as you work with the breath energy in certain parts of the body, memories come up, attitudes come up, emotions come up. Because the way you breathe is an important part of the emotions. There was once a teacher who heard that one of my former students was working on the breath this way. And he says, why are you fooling around with the breath? Why are you trying to straighten out the breath way? The breath is just a fabrication. It's just a sankara. And she mentioned that to me, and I told her, well, if it had been me, I would have responded and said, well, your body is just a sankara. Why do you bathe it? If you're not bathing your body, it means you've got some issues around the body that really should be looked into. Well, it's the same with the breath. When we're focusing here on the breath, directing our thoughts to the breath, evaluating the breath, we're actually engaging in all the different levels of fabrication. The bodily fabrication, which is the in and out breath. The verbal fabrication is direct to thought and evaluation. Then there's mental fabrication, feelings and perceptions, feelings here being feeling tones, like pleasure or pain, neither pleasure nor pain and the perceptions being the basic labels we apply to things. So as you're directing your thought to the breath and evaluating how comfortable it is or not, you're going to be using certain perceptions to stay with the breath. And you'll be finding that different ways of perceiving the breath or labeling it are going to have different effects on how you breathe, how the breath is sensed in different parts of the body. If you perceive the body as a bellows that has to pull the breath in, push the breath out, a lot of the breath energy, say, around the, the rib cage gets hardened. So it can become a bellows. If you think of the body as being more porous, okay, that'll change the way you breathe. And you find that different ways of thinking about the breath and evaluating it will give rise to different ways of breathing. Thinking about the breath in your toes, in your fingers, the base of your spine, all these places you don't normally think about it, the breath in the bones, the breath in your brain. It's useful to range around in the body, to explore areas that you don't normally explore. And think about the breath and what direction the breath goes in those different parts of the body as, as it comes in and goes out. 
Here we're talking more about the subtle breath energies. And try to notice how the different subtle breath energies in the body working together, or are they working at cross purposes? You want to look at that. And are there, are there parts of the body that really starve for breath energy? What can you do to provide them with more? And as you work on these issues, you're getting more and more practical experience, more sensitivity to these different types of fabrication. You're actually creating a state of becoming. This was another issue that was brought up on time with John Lee. He had been teaching meditation to a senior monk in Bangkok, who asked him one day, well, we're practicing for the sake of getting rid of becoming, right? And the Pali word was bhava. And John Lee says, right. He said, well, why are we creating more states of becoming here as we create concentration? And John Lee responded, that's the whole point. You're creating states of concentration so you can study them. You're going to understand them. States of becoming like this. What are they? How are they made? And as you learn how to do it skillfully in the concentration, then you're going to learn about other states of becoming as well and the processes by which they're formed. As he said, it's like having a chicken laying eggs. If you destroy the eggs, you never get to understand what eggs are all about, and you never get to eat. Concentration gives you a sense of well-being, a sense of strength and hands-on practice with what it means to create a state of becoming, because it's the same fabrications are involved in your emotions as well. This is indicated by the fact that in Pali the word bhava, with a short a, is the word for becoming, and the word bhava, with a long a, is the word for an emotional state. They're very closely aligned. And you find that your emotions are fabricated out of the same raw materials. There's a perception and a feeling that goes along with a perception. And then you start thinking about and evaluating the situation in light of that perception. And then your body gets involved as well. There's an effect on the way you breathe. And we all do this unconsciously. In fact, so unconsciously we think that our emotions are our basic states, it's what, almost what we are. They're the raw data of our experience. What I feel is most basic to what I am. We often let our feelings or our emotions take over because they seem to be so insistent and so basic. But as the Buddha points out, they're as fabricated as anything else in your experience. And if you see that the emotion is unhealthy, causing suffering to you, causing suffering to other people, the fact that you've been working with the breath and working with these different types of fabrication gives you a handle. At the very least, you can breathe in a different way. Say anger comes in. You can focus on the breath as a way of stepping outside of the anger. And you'll notice, of course, that the anger has done something to the breathing, and then the breathing will have triggered off some hormones. And so you try to calm the breathing down. Now this means the hormones are still going to be sloshing around in your bloodstream for a while, so you learn to make a distinction between what you're doing with the breath and then the leftover effects of what you had been doing with the breath before you're really paying attention. And it gives you a better place to stay. So you can look at the remaining types of fabrication, the way you're thinking and your perceptions, your evaluations, your feelings of pleasure or pain around this. And you can start thinking about what you could do differently. The fact that you're working with the breath means it goes beyond just a mental exercise. You're getting into the physical side as well, which is important. That's why I said that we have issues around the breath. because there are, the breathing has a lot to do with the physical side of your emotions.
But if you're seeing yourself as victimized, you might want to change that perception. Or if you're seeing yourself on top of a situation where you're able to get back at somebody else, you might want to change that perception as well. If you're angry at somebody, you want to re remind yourself, okay, the fact that you're angry here means that you're probably going to say and do something stupid. Because anger seems to block off certain good qualities like a sense of shame and a sense of compunction, a sense of restraint. And the more justified the anger and the more you feel that you've been unjustly treated, the more there are going to be perceptions in the mind that say, okay, here's my chance to get back, or here's my chance to justify myself, right a few wrongs. But for the Buddha, the question always is not so much, okay, who is right and who is wrong, who deserves to suffer, who doesn't deserve to suffer. The question is, do you want to suffer? Do you want to keep making yourself suffer? And when the answer is no, then he gives you the tools. For looking at the situation in a different way, holding different perceptions, thinking about it, giving yourself different narratives, learning to use your imagination. Again, not because you want to say, well, the person may be actually right. That may not be the case. The person could be dead wrong. But again, the question from the Buddhist point of view is, do you want to keep suffering? If you don't want to keep suffering, you've got to change your perception of the situation. So you change the narratives you tell. That's the direct of thought and evaluation. You learn to question some of your knee-jerk perceptions about what that other person's intentions were, how they think about you, what their attitude is toward you. Realizing that one, you don't really know, and two, if you have a very good idea, still, that's not the issue. The issue is, what are you doing to make yourself suffer? And do you want to keep on doing that? So the fact that we're learning to work with the breath and all these different forms of fabrication in the present moment means we get more sensitive that we can do this fabrication skillfully, and then we can turn that knowledge to look at our emotions. Realizing, as the Buddha said, we're like someone coming through the desert, hot, trembling, thirsty. We see someone else has done something wrong. He says, you look at it as a little bit of water in a cow's footprint. You need the water. But you have to be very careful about how you take the water, because you know there's a lot of dirt in the footprint. So you have to be very careful to focus on the good parts, knowing full well that there's a lot of bad in that person. But that's not what you want to take. You don't want to feed on the dirt. You want to feed on the water, because you need the water. That's a very different perception from the one where you're the judge sitting on a bench, 15 feet up in the air, pointing down at these little people down there that you're going to decide what their fate's going to be. This is why the Buddha uses so many analogies and images and similes in his teachings to give you a different range of perceptions, a different way of looking at things. And then there's that whole narrative about many, many lifetimes. Try to keep that in mind as well. Again, the purpose is not here to let people get away with murder, but first you've got to stop murdering yourself murdering your goodness, creating more and more suffering for yourself. And you can sort out all these issues inside, okay? then you're in a much better position to figure out what would be the skillful thing to do. If someone is doing something that you can stop, how do you stop them skillfully? And if right now is not the right time to say or do anything, well, when will be the right time? And what should you do and what should you say? When you're more on top of the process of fabrication, you can do it more skillfully. And that's one of the reasons why we focus here on the breath, and we work with the breath. It 
so we can create better states of becoming. And it's only when we do the becoming skillfully that we can ultimately get to a point where we can go beyond. You can't bypass this process. You have to go through the skill to get to that point beyond skill. Where all the fabrications fall away. <laughs>